Thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, we'll be talking about what I like to refer to as the alphabet soup of digital engineering. Uh, and as you'll see, there are lots of acronyms. So I'll try to explain what each of these are and hopefully that'll clarify things up. Uh, but the ultimate goal today is to kind of look at the history and where we're going with digital engineering, what it is and how it's useful. So first off, uh, the letter Three letter acronyms brought to you today by EES, Elite Engineering Services, as well as PTC, uh, which actually just stands for PTC. Historically, it was the Parametric Technology Corporation, but they've since dropped that and now it is, in fact, just PTC. So, uh, as you can see, of course, our favorite characters at Sesame Street are helping us out. There will be lots and lots of letters, uh, as I like to refer to them, the TLAs, three letter acronyms. So we'll get into those shortly. Just quickly, a little bit about myself. My name is Stuart Weiler. I'm the Director of CAD and PLM at Elite Engineering Services. Uh, Elite Engineering Services is a part of the Elite Aerospace Group. We are focused in aerospace. And then the Elite Engineering Services Group uh, is a division within EAG, which is not entirely dedicated to aerospace. We have a lot of aerospace expertise. Uh, myself and my team all have a, a bit of an aerospace slant, but we certainly can help people using the various digital engineering tools, regardless of industry as well. Uh, personally, I have about 15 years of experience in aerospace, working with various CAD and various PLM tools. So certainly quite a few of uh, those different tools that make up the digital engineering story that we'll be talking about today. Um, in that aerospace experience, I do have most of a slant towards Boeing, but I've worked with the other aerospace manufacturers as well. Um, but as you'll see in the, the TLAs, a lot of them I might refer to from the BAD, which is the Boeing Acronym Dictionary. Uh, and if any of you are familiar with Boeing, I'm sure you're aware they can speak entirely in sentences of TLAs, hence the 16 page long dictionary of acronyms. So the TLAs, are very much listed out in the BAD if you're ever looking for a long list of acronyms that you want to learn. Here is my contact information. Uh, if you have any interest in, in contacting me, if you want to continue the discussion, please feel free to reach out. Always love a good conversation. Uh, oh, and also wanted to mention I have been working with MBD, another TLA for today, which is model-based definition. Uh, I started working on MBD in about 2007, working on the Boeing 787. So in our discussion today, we'll be talking a bit about MBD because that is a big part of digital engineering. Uh, so just wanted to show MBD has been around for quite a while. When we started using it in 2007, we were not the, the first ones to use it. There have been military standards and aerospace standards created for MBD years before that. So MBD is actually a lot older than most people realize. So here's kind of a quick sheet of the three-letter acronyms. These are most of the ones that we'll be talking about today. Uh, as they come up, I'll of course elaborate on them again, but just listed alphabetically some of the ones that are very specific to digital engineering. Uh, I'd like to kind of give you this background first, so that way if I refer to them, hopefully you'll, you'll recognize them. The list can of course go on. As I mentioned, the Boeing Acronym Dictionary, or the BAD, is about 16 pages long, so there is no shortage of those TLAs. So what is digital engineering? Well, first, I think you have to kind of go back to what was engineering before computers. So this picture here, you can see this is what it looked like. People work at drafting tables and they would draw out what they were going to design and somehow you had to take the designs from the table third row back on the left uh, and make those designs work with someone from all the way in the back row. Someone had to check all of those. You had to find a way to make all those parts and put them all together. And needless to say, it was a very big operation that was very difficult to manage. The idea of doing everything digitally is that it makes it easier. You can have less people involved that are going to get the designs done a lot faster. So a, a quote that I saw about digital engineering is that digital engineering is the art of creating, capturing, and integrating data using a digital skill set, which means you don't have to have these draftsmen putting together your drawings. Now, it's absolutely a lost art. Uh, you can do the same things digitally because you still need the same end result. You have to be able to capture all of that information, but there's a lot of benefits. For example, you can take your parts and put them together in assemblies. 
in order to verify them in a way that you never could if you just had a paper drawing. To make sure that two parts are going to fit together when all you have is a drawing of them is very, very challenging to do. By doing it digitally, you have a 3D representation or maybe even just a 2D representation depending on the software you're using, but you can put those together, see how they're going to fit together, and do these checks. That way, before a part is ever built, you can be assured that it will meet certain criteria and you're doing a lot less guess and check in order to make your designs come to life. You can be sure of everything up front. The further to the left that you push these checks, the faster and cheaper you'll be able to do your designs with significantly better quality. Of course, change management would be virtually impossible in this scenario as well because you're constantly going to have to make changes and it's done by taking an eraser and erasing something, making a note saying this is what's changed, or making an all new drawing. But when it's digital, it's very easy to change. So there's a lot of benefits of digital engineering. So of course the digital engineering story is going to start in the engineering department. There's a couple of various different tools we want to look at. Uh, so I listed out CAD, CAD, which is the design. That's the, the part we actually are putting together a design. So you can see here, I've listed out the PTC tools that you would use for this. Creo Parametric is your base design tool. This is where you would make your design, you put together your parts, you make your assemblies, and you have your 3D elements that you can now look at. CAE is the engineering aspect. This is more getting into the visualization and the analysis aspects. So you could use a tool like Creo Simulate. You can see I've shown some pictures here, checking the stress, doing the analyses of that. And so now, from your design, you're going to take it to the next step, which is CAE, and check it. And if you're doing all of these in the past, this would have been done by making a prototype and putting it onto a, a test bed, perhaps loading it with forces and just going until it breaks to see was it designed well enough. Now you can do all of it digitally, so that way you'll know in advance, is this going to be strong enough? But that means you can also optimize because you know, oh, it's not only is it strong enough, but it's much stronger than I need to be. I could remove material in order to make it lighter weight or just optimize it for the design process, which kind of leads us into CAM, which is computer-aided manufacturing. This is the part where you're going to now actually cut the metal or whatever material that it is. But for a PTC tool, that would be something like the Creo Complete Machining Extension. Well, now you're going to take the part that you've designed in Creo Parametric, you've analyzed it in Creo Simulate, and now you're going to actually program the machine that's going to cut it. It could be a, a CNC of any sort, a lathe, a mill, various number of axes. Uh, and the Creo Complete Machining will, will support that. So now you're going from doing your design digitally, checking it digitally, to the rough equivalent of being able to then make it from that same design file. It's not exactly like pressing the print button and a piece of paper comes out of your printer, because you still have a lot more expertise that has to go behind it, but this is going to create the G code that's going to run the machine, which will actually make your part. So going back to understanding the history, CAD is actually a lot older than most people realize as well. Now, 1957 is the very early roots of it, of course, but CAD has really been around, popularly at least, since the 1980s. Most companies have started using CAD and understand its need. And that's when the drafting table, the room full of drafting tables you saw in the picture before, really started to be supplanted by computers. Now, initially it was kind of a mainframe program. So it was something that was being run on these giant machines in the, the servers, and then you had a terminal that was connected to them. And that kind of transferred over to being more of a desktop tool so that now each person can run it on their machine. And we're even now starting to see kind of a reversion back to the mainframe idea, except it's in the cloud, where the processing power is being done elsewhere, and you're kind of more on a, a terminal mindset. So the pendulum kind of swung around in, in that sense, uh, but CAD has certainly evolved quite a bit. Initially, it was really just about sketching up and doing a digital version of the 2D. So people were familiar with how to do a drawing on a drafting table, and then they started using computers to do the same thing. And then it was now we're going to actually do a three-dimensional model based on parameters, and that will then drive 
the drawing. And that's kind of what then led us to the more modern version of CAD that we think of. So the, the first version was definitely very different, but it's, it's been moving in the direction that it's been going to in the, the modern versions of it. Now, there's a tool from PTC that's called Creo Simulation Live, or CSL, because of course we're talking about three-letter acronyms. And this is a little bit of a gray area. It, it's not exactly a CAD tool, it's not exactly an analysis tool. It's kind of somewhere in between. There's definitely a Venn diagram situation where it does some of the CAD, some of the analysis. And I wanted to kind of single this out because Previously, you would have to do your design and then typically send it to someone else who specializes in analysis, and they would use a separate tool to do that analysis. And then when all your design is done and your analysis is done, you're going to send that to something else that's then going to actually put together your programming code. Using CSL and using Creo, you can actually do this all in the same tool now. And CSL is more of a design tool than an analysis tool. It gives a designer analysis information. You can determine, is my part strong enough? Is my part light enough? Is my part optimized early on? And so instead of doing a concept phase or design phase and then a prototype phase, you can kind of push all of those together. Creo Simulation Live gives you the designer the information and abilities that they didn't have before. That way they can eliminate some of that reiterative design process of going back and forth between analysis and design and analysis and the design and analysis and the design until you get to the right part. The designer can do all of that up front and an analysis can be done just at the end of the final verification. So it's a little bit different than those previous tools that I mentioned before, just CAD and CA and, and CAM. It's an upfront tool, but it, it blurs the line. So it's worth separating out. Now, once you have all of this, we're still not really in the fully digital engineering. We're doing engineering digitally, but it's still just within engineering. Your design phase, your analysis phase, maybe even some of the manufacturing engineering phase. But when does it really become an enterprise tool? And that's when we're getting into the systems behind it and the full integration of the whole company. How does digital engineering benefit everyone? Not just the engineer. Because the goal of digital engineering isn't just make drawings faster. It's to make better products and to make the entire company more successful. So going forward, we'll be thinking about all of the various things throughout the whole company. Well, how do you do that? You are making drawings in engineering. You're making a bill of materials or a bomb, because again, more three-letter acronym. Uh, but how would you do that and why would you want to do it? It's all about better products, more efficient, doing things faster, getting things done, for your customers, faster, better, cheaper. Those are the benefits. Of course, you're saving money and you're, you're saving time doing it as well. So getting into that, what are some of those enterprise tools? Well, first off, coming back to what I said in the beginning about model-based definition, this is a little bit of an enterprise tool as well. There's model-based definition, which is MBD, and there's model-based enterprise, MBE, and the MBD is basically a 3D version of a drawing. Instead of having a drawing that is your authoritative document, tells you everything that you need to know about your design, now you have a 3D model. So that instead of just a flat picture, you can rotate it around, you can interact with it typically. You can query it, take measurements and do cross sections. But instead of having to look just at what you're presented at in the drawing, you can actually really inspect it much more. That's MBD. But MBE is when it's now use company-wide, but the entire company is benefiting from it. That as a whole is now DPD, which is digital product definition. Everything that goes with the engineering to fully explain the details. So MBD might be just the model, but DPD is going to be the model and everything else related to it. And that could be things like the specifications. If you're going to design something in aluminum, you're going to say on the model, make from aluminum alloy 2021 T4 as per all these specifications. Adding those specifications to the MBD would be your full DPD because you have to fully define everything about it. So anything that's not captured in the MBD itself, that plus the other specifications 
details, requirements, that's making up the DPD. That's an explanation of those three. Now, quick look at what MDD looks like. You can see in the picture on the left, you're going to have some of the notes. Some of the, I mean, in this case, we're just saying the proprietary information. This is a, a model, and the intellectual property is owned by this company. But your other details as well, your model details and your material details, your finished specifications, all of that information, the things that are typically notes listed on a drawing or on a parts list or on a bill of materials, are going to be shown in the model. Now, if it's an assembly, there will, of course, be a bill of materials. And that's pretty much going to be the product tree, your assembly, and then it's children, and if there's any children of the children, if there's any sub-assemblies, the quantities of everything, that's already captured in the tree, but that's a part of the DPD that we talked about. And then any uh, information that's dimensional, whether it's measurements or GD&T, that would all be shown in the model as well. By looking at the model, it should be manufacturable. The idea is not to just make a 3D part and assume that by giving it to someone they can press a button and it prints it. It's that it's fully defined. Everything that they would need in order to manufacture needs to be fully contained in that DPD because MDD is replacing 2D, which means it's not eliminating the need for this information, it's just presenting it differently. So if you needed this information before in a 2D world, it needs to be there in a 3D world. You just have to find a different way to show it. And this is what it looks like. All that information is being captured in here. And anything that can't be captured in the model, that would be added with it, typically as part of the build materials or a specification to, again, make up that full DPD. Now, once you have all of this digital engineering, what do you do with it? Typically, it starts that people are going to keep it on their desktop or on a network drive. And as they start trying to share, it becomes more and more challenging. And that's when we introduce a system to manage all of that data. And there's PDM and there's PLM. Now, they're interchangeable in a certain initial phase, but PLM is definitely much more advanced. And I'm going to go into this very shortly. But the, the gist of it is that PDM is typically an engineering tool only. So initially, the CAD might be modeled by PDM. It's really just doing some engineering document management. Maybe some amount of review process might be involved, for example, doing a release process. But it often is used in conjunction with another system that's doing document management. PLM is now when it becomes an enterprise tool, not just an engineering. And it's used throughout the whole company. It's typically the prime source. That's where people look for their information. So now whether you're in engineering, you're in quality department, you're in manufacturing department, you're all going to go to that same one database. That's the single source of truth. That's more typical of PLM. A full life cycle process where everyone that needs to buy off on the design is going to approve it within that same system. So instead of drawing or printing out a drawing and passing it around for people to sign it for their approval, that can all be done now inside of the system digitally. And every system, uh, every department is using that same system. That is more typical of PLM. So to break it down into a Venn diagram, pretty much everything that PDM does is contained within PLM. So again, and I like to, to show that typically, and there's always going to be exceptions, PDM is typically the engineering only tool versus PLM is going to encompass all of that and more, making it more of an enterprise tool. So the things that people think of for PDM and PLM both are typically document management, design data management, change management. Project management is a little bit of a gray area. Some of that becomes more of a PLM aspect. But then there's collaborative engineering, and that means that you've got the ability to have multiple people working on the design together. Not necessarily side by side of, hey, you work on that, I'll work on this. But together, we're working on this as a whole. And that allows for a lot more efficient engineering. But it's very hard to do collaborative engineering if you're maintaining files on your own computers or thumb drives or even on a network drive because now you risk overwriting each other's data, stepping on each other's toes, deleting things. 
by introducing a PDM system or a POM system, you have control over who has access to the data. You make sure that there's only a single person working on anything at a time. You can control saying only these people have access to do these certain things or these particular projects. And then you get into change management saying when something can be changed. You know, do you need a certain authority to make the change? When a change happens, here's who's going to release and approve. POM adds in a lot more of those company-wide things, supplier management, quality management, and then general workflow and approval process, uh, typically throughout a company and moving beyond even maybe sometimes involving some of your supply chain. Uh, your vendors might provide data for you in your POM system. They might be working in your system. And your customers might want to access the data as well. And if you're giving access to vendors and customers, that's much more typical of a PLM system, and that really becomes that enterprise solution. So it's a, a Venn diagram in a sense, but PLM typically captures everything of PDM. So it's very common that companies will start with PDM and then branch more into PLM when they realize that they've kind of reached the full potential of PDM and they want to go further. Now, of course, there's other systems that a company might use. SCM, which is configuration management. In short, it's PDM, but specific to software. So it manages the configuration of your various software as you make changes and check it in and check it out. Very much like you do for CAD for software. So a very, very similar idea. Um, some companies that are doing products that are going to be more electrical and are going to be programmable, they'll have to maintain their software as well as their mechanical design, maybe as well as their electrical design. Uh, electrical design is more in the realm of the mechanical CAD, but the software is typically separate, and that would be managed typically in a SCM. As you move downstream in the business, you'll typically encounter an ERP, which is an Enterprise Resource Planning System. This is a definite Venn diagram scenario again. There are things that PLM can do, there are things that ERP can do, but there are things that only one or the other can do. So the most successful companies will have ERP and PLM connected, where your design data might start in PLM, and as it matures, then it might automatically be connected to ERP so that information is going to flow. So typically the things that are going to flow from PLM to ERP is your bill of materials. So you'd integrate them, and this picture shows you a little bit of what it might look like because there's various different BOMs. I know it's not three-letter acronyms because we're putting a letter before it, but bear with me. You might have an engineering bill of materials, and that might be what you see on the left side of this picture. You have a table and you have the various components of it. You have a couple different legs. Each leg is going to be made up of a couple different pieces, and you have a tabletop. But when you actually go to manufacture it, they have a different sort of bill of materials because for them, they see it as instead of a table with four leg assemblies and a top, they see it as how are we going to manufacture it? Well, this part of the factory is going to make the leg assemblies, which is actually going to make the leg separate from the pin and then those get put together into the leg assembly, and then these couple leg assemblies get put together with this other station. So an E-bomb and an M-bomb, while they're very similar and they're very much related, are going to be different. And the POM is managing the E-bomb, the engineering bill materials, versus ERP is typically more of the M-bomb, the things that are going to actually be manufactured. Now, there's other bill materials as well. For example, the sales bomb, that's what you're selling to the customer. So the customer, they might want a table that's going to be a round top or a square top or a rectangular or diamond, but they don't necessarily care how it's built. So for them, in the sales bomb, it's going to be very different. It's more about options and configurations. M-bomb is as built and E-bomb is as designed. Other systems still might manage other build materials. The service bomb, if someone wants to buy a replacement part, well, first they could buy the entire new assembly and replace the entire thing, but maybe they only want to replace a leg that broke. Well, can they get a leg or can they get a leg assembly? What's the sellable item? Various things that might be glued together might not be sold separately, or things that are welded together might not be sold separately. So the customer 
doesn't need to see all of the items that went into manufacturing because they're not buying component one, two, three, or four. They're only buying the assembly of those as a packaged item. So there's various different bombs, and this kind of also explains the difference for the different tools and systems that you might see in a company. Now, there's a few other systems that have a lot of overlap with ERP, MRP and MES, which are Materials Requirement Planning and Manufacturing Execution Software. And this matrix here, uh, you can see my reference for it, uh, but this is kind of the most succinct way I've seen of breaking down where ERP, MRP, and MES function. Not every company will have all three. There's times where you might have one or the other or two of the three. Um, certainly, if you were going to pick one, I think most commonly ERP is going to do the job of MRP and MES, uh, but they are different. And enterprise resource planning is more about the getting everything organized for manufacturing. Materials requirements planning is more of a procurement tool, getting the items that you need, getting them in place, and then the MES is about actually doing the build. So if you're going to put together a work instruction, for example, it can be done in ERP, and certain ERP tools are more uh, complete than others. But if you have different tools for it, ERP would be more upfront, pushing downstream the MRP about buying the tools, and the S about the manufacturing process, how it's going to actually get done. I'll save these uh, for further discussions in the future. Other systems that you might see, uh, we talked about uh, SCM, which is a software configuration management. There's also a supply chain management. And this is more about managing your vendors. Who are you buying things from? Because you might need to buy a screw, but you might buy it from five or six different vendors, maybe depending on availability or pricing or current inventory. And this is a tool that allows you to help manage all of those. A CRM is a customer relationship management tool. And that's typically a sales tool that your sales team is going to use to manage who they talk to about your customers, who, what, the, what it is that they're going to purchase. Uh, and an SLM, Service Lifecycle Management, that's typically down at the end of the stream. That's about how are you managing the serviceable items. So I mentioned the example of the table if a customer wants to buy a replacement part. The selling of those parts to the manufacturing of those parts for sale. For sale. Uh, kind of a quick example, but you think of more of like a complex design like a, an automobile. The service life cycle would be how do you manage the maintenance and the things that need to get done later on? Because when a company like Ford makes their car, they only make so much by manufacturing and selling the car. They make more money later on by servicing it. So they have a system that will manage to tell them when are various customers do for services. So that way they can send out notifications to say, according to our records, you're due for an oil change. You're due for an overhaul. And all of those extra services that they sell are a lot more profitable for the business than the initial sale of the car might be sometimes. So managing all of that additional service in the future can be very important. So I put together a little bit of a diagram to show how these different systems actually fit together. You have to, of course, remember the acronym to, to really understand. Um, but I want to also throw out the, the caveat that some variations might exist. I put PLM up front, and that's because of my history as a designer. I see the engineering design being the driver for everything. Some people might say that something like CRM might actually be up front because the customers make a purchase or the customers have an interest, and that's going to be what then drives engineering to go and do their design. Uh, versus some places will do the designs and they'll actually maybe get to the point of having a manufactured product before they go out and sell it. So it depends on the industry of where CRM might be, whether it's up front or, or towards the end. You might also see a separate tool about requirements management. If you're doing design for a specific customer, they might send you requirements and those requirements are then going to drive your manufacturing or your engineering design. So a requirements management tool might show up before PLM. But I think most commonly you'll see something like this where PLM is up front managing your product data, and then it's going to transition more towards the factory where you're going to do your 
enterprise resource planning, your, your materials resource planning, your manufacturing execution system as you get into from planning to production. And then finally, towards the end, you'll get into selling it, which is where your CRM comes in, and servicing it, which is where your SLM comes into play. Hey, so there's a lot of overlap in all of these where you'll have one in one system, you want to be integrated with the next, so that way data will transfer through and it keeps going down the line. And having that integration gets you the most value in your system. Hey, Stuart? Yes. This is Dane. Could you go back to that slide? A lot of times I'll see out there, there'll be a couple networks in between these. For instance, there'll be a plant information network that they call the PIN. And the reason for that a lot of times is IT doesn't want the enterprise side getting to the raw data. But you know, a lot of that's going away with you know what, what we're selling. But you'll you'll see different levels there, like almost like a firewall to use an outdated term. Yeah, absolutely. You know, some some companies want full integration. They want the design to to transfer over. That way you have a transformation of the bill of materials from the E-bomb to the M-bomb to the S-bomb. Other companies might have a firewall scenario because the engineering data might be proprietary or might be security controlled. Um, so there are certainly some scenarios where the data is not integrated for one reason or another. It could be a limitation of the networking. They just can't handle that or they might choose not to. So this is, like I said, variations may exist. Uh, it might be different in some companies by choice or by necessity. So roughly, where does the CAD flow, kind of coming back to what, what I was talking about in the beginning, uh, you'll see that your requirements will drive the CAD data design. And once the CAD data has been created, it's that initial life cycle, that's when it goes into a PLM database. Could be PDM based on certain companies just not needing PLM yet, might be PDM or PLM, but the CAD will go into PLM. There's usually some amount of iterations between the CAD and PLM, be checked out and checked in and checked out and checked in as the design progresses. Eventually it gets reviewed and approved. And once it's finally released, it's released in the PLM database. And then it's ready for the downstream groups by going to a CAM system. Well, the analysis might be in here as well as necessary, but then it would go to a CAM system where you're gonna then program the machines that are actually going to do the manufacturing, and then that can be set to CNC. Uh, and at this point, it's actually being manufactured. Further downstream, your quality groups may or may not be looking back at the CAD. Ideally, they would be, especially if you're using uh, digital product definition or MBD, you would then be looking back at the CAD as your authority. So they would be looking back into the PLM database to reference all of that material. So kind of wrapping up on the digital engineering, some of the next resources that you'll see, I pulled this from the Department of Defense, uh, their presentation on the digital engineering strategy. Uh, it's kind of a long document explaining what it is that they're looking to do and what they're hoping to achieve and a little bit of how they're planning to do it. But you can see these are some of the expected benefits of digital engineering. So hopefully you'll uh, see a lot of these are sort of some of the things that I mentioned before. But in short, it's about getting better products faster and cheaper. Uh, you know, they, they worded it a little bit differently, but that's the gist of it here. You know, things like enhanced communication. That's ultimately going to lead to better product designs and built faster. Because if you have problems communicating the information, that's going to slow down the design process. So that's going to yield problems in the design. So we're looking to solve all those same problems. So the DOD is coming up and actually executing the same strategy that we've been talking about. Uh, DOD is very much moving towards digital engineering. And they might have stated different reasons, but the same net results. And you can see this here. And also here, again, from the DOD Digital Engineering, uh, digital engineering Strategy, um, a quote I saw, the, the cornerstone of digital engineering is the authoritative source of truth. Well, in an engineering company, this would be PLM. In a software company, this would be SCM. 
But from this, this diagram here that you see, uh, labeled figure, figure four, the examples of models connected via the authority, authoritative source of truth. In the discussion we've been having, that authoritative source of truth is PLM. You can see as the information is flowing around, you have your engineering models, management models, design models, all of that can be managed in PLM. As you get more towards manufacturing and verification, it might be PLM, but it might also start flowing downstream into something like an ERP or MES later on. So all of these tools are going to integrate together, and every company that's been successful with it has continued the digital engineering strategy further and further. It went from just doing a three-dimensional design with that driving drawings to now being an enterprise-wide solution. And you can see even the biggest entities are, are moving in that direction. So I hope this has been interesting for you and that it gives you a good understanding of what digital engineering is and, and why it's valuable. Uh, we'll, of course, have further conversations about how to get there. Uh, but thank you very much for your time and for joining. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to discuss them. All right, well, thank you, everyone. I'll be sharing the link for the recording of this if you wanted to share it around. And I hope today was useful. Have a nice day, everyone.